<laughs> wow. Wow. Great stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what could possibly go wrong? Thank you for that fantastic welcome. Do you know, I have spent 25 years of my life fighting against the new undemocratic, bureaucratic, and increasingly authoritarian form of rule that comes from Brussels. And I've got to tell you, the day my fellow countrymen, on June 23rd, 2016, despite the threats, despite the bullying, voted for our country to be free again was the proudest day of my life. Because if you think about it, no free people would ever willingly give up the right to govern themselves, would they? They wouldn't do it. It doesn't happen through the history of mankind, and yet it happened to us. Because all the way through, going back 45, 50 years, we were assured, don't worry your little heads, this is just about trade. It won't affect your sovereignty, it won't affect your independence, and I'm sure you've heard one or two of those arguments here in the Republic of Ireland. The whole thing, frankly, has been a gigantic con from the word go. And I'm, I'm pleased to see that since the Brexit vote, we've got Eurosceptic parties springing up right across Europe. In Sweden, a Eurosceptic party currently tops the polls. In France, there are now a variety of Eurosceptic parties on both the right and the left. In Germany, a brand new Eurosceptic party achieved nearly 100 seats in the Bundestag. And if you go to the east of Europe, if you go to Hungary, you go to Poland, you go to the Czech Republic, you go to Slovakia, just look at what those Prime Ministers are standing up and saying about the attempt by Brussels to impose migrant quotas on them. Just look at what they're saying. Indeed, the UK commentator Andrew Marr said, if you listen to the Prime Ministers of those four countries talking about Brussels, talking about migration, they make Nigel Farage sound like a foreign office diplomat. <laughs> so right across Europe, we see the growth and development of political movements, of people that say, we actually love Europe. We love the different nationalities of Europe, the different peoples of Europe. In my case, the different wines of Europe. <laughs> we love Europe. But what we don't like is this attempt by the European Union to hijack the word Europe. To them, Europe is that flag. Europe is that anthem. Europe are those glass and steel structures. Europe are tens of thousands of highly paid bureaucrats. And they think, because they've got all of this, that they own Europe and the word. Well, they don't. We, the individual countries and peoples of Europe, we own the word Europe, not them. So I'm pleased to see this growth of these new political movements everywhere. With, of course, one very curious exception. What on earth is going on in the politics of this country. How, I mean, how much more humiliated can the Irish nation be than for years being run by the Troika? The indignity, a few years back, of your budget being seen by the German government before it was put to the Doyle. You are, you are now not even a net beneficiary anymore. 
you are paying into the European budget and your Taoiseach said in Strasbourg the other week he's happy for Ireland to pay even more into the European budget. Are you pleased about that? Yes, 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 he's happy for you to pay more. You've heard this morning just how much you've lost by giving away what should be yours, 200 miles of the Atlantic Ocean. Your, your politicians have taken you into a currency, which frankly you're ill-suited for. And yet I get told that Ireland is a very pro-EU country. Oh yes, Michael O'Leary told me, so it must be right. <laughs> but we, and there is this, there is this perception, because in Lisbon 1, O'Leary was against the treaty, do you remember? And called the European Commission the evil empire. But then, when it came to Lisbon 2, he was for the treaty, and thought the European Union was wonderful. I'm sure folks, that change of heart had nothing to do with money whatsoever. <laughs> but we're always told, we're always told Ireland is a pro-EU country. Barrett Carr said it when he was in Strasbourg the other week. The perception of the media across Europe is that Ireland is a very pro-EU country, very servile to the demands of Brussels. And my analysis is this. I don't think Ireland is a pro-EU country. I think the political, media and big business class of Dublin, they're the ones. They're the ones. Oh, they love it. They love it. You want to meet the Irish men and women that work for the European Commission. I meet them. They love it. And what's not to like? 16% top rate tax, 10,000 civil servants in Brussels earning more than the British Prime Minister, seven or eight weeks holiday a year, no chance of being sacked if you're incompetent. In fact, from what I can see, you probably get promoted. <laughs> and Well, they must have found Mr. Van Rompuy somewhere, I don't know. And probably the best pension deal any of these men and women are going to get anywhere in the world. For them, what's not to like? But the problem, folks, is that they dominate the media conversation. And whilst there are people, individuals in this country, some independent politicians, academics, some journalists, whilst there are people in this country that will stand up and make the counter-argument, what you do not have in this country is an organised, mobilised organisation that is out there with the absolute distinct attempt from day one to take away from the politicians their votes. Because if I learn anything in UKIP, however good an intellectual argument may be, However powerfully you make a point, it's only when they think they might lose their job because of you that they start to sit up and listen. There are a very large number of men and women in this country who frankly, at this moment in time, do not have the democratic representation that they deserve. And that is something I think, well, it's up to you of course, but I think that is something in a democracy that needs to be put to an end. And those of you that are here today and are keen and enthusiastic and believe that the nation state is the building block, the essential building block, that democracy is the system that we wish to live in, it is incumbent now upon you to organise, to mobilise and to put up candidates and to fight those European elections in just 15 months from now because you will win elected representation and once you win elected representation you become part of 
the national debate. And as you become part of the national debate, they will call you all the names under the sun. You will, of course, all be homophobes. You will all be racists. You will all be xenophobes. You will all be bigots. And this is because, this is because when our side of the argument talks about national democracy, when our side of the argument talks about pride in our nation, when our side of the argument talks about controlling our borders and having a sensible, grown-up immigration policy, when our side of the argument talks about these things, they can't fight back against us with arguments, so what they do with their abuse is they go for the man and not for the bull. But actually, but actually, none of it matters, because whatever the mainstream media say about a new political movement in this country that is standing up for the right values, it doesn't matter. There's a chap in America who's proved this to a certain extent. <laughs> Former. Now, well, now whether you, whether you like Trump or not isn't really the point. But what did the Donald do? He courted as much controversy as he possibly could. Because controversy means you get more front page headlines and you dominate the news agenda. And he allied that to a, an extraordinary use of the medium known as Twitter. And by using Twitter, he goes round the back of the political class, the media class, the big business class. He reaches straight to American men and women and voters, and he's now got 47.6 million followers. Can I suggest, can I suggest that whatever, whatever happens in Ireland, that you make sure that mobilization of the internet is absolutely up there as one of the top things that you must do. This European project is not going to work. Europe has been divided from north to south by the euro. The euro has been bad for Ireland, but arguably it's been a total catastrophe for countries like Greece. And economic and monetary union is not going to work in Europe unless the Germans become like the Greeks or the Greeks become like the Germans. And far from making this, Far from making this a union in which countries are coming together and people are getting friendlier, we now actually see north-south enmity because of the capital transfers required to keep those Mediterranean countries in the euro. So we have that split. And we also have an east-west split. These prime ministers in Hungary and Poland mean business. These people lived under Nazism. They lived for decades under communism. When the wall fell, they reached out to the West and they held our hand because we offered them not just the European Union, we offered them NATO membership as well. So that is why they so enthusiastically joined the Union. But now I hear my Polish and Hungarian and Czech friends saying, in fact, I was with Vaclav Klaus this week, the former Czech president, and he said, it looks to me like my country is going back into a new form of communism where your parliaments are overruled, your courts are overruled. So, so this union will not work, it does not work, it is increasingly unloved by the peoples of Europe. We, in the Brexit campaign, I think I can say have more than done our bit thus far, but now, but now, now it is time for you to make these arguments, to organise and to mobilise in this country, and I wish you Godspeed in doing so, and if I can ever, ever be of any help or any assistance, 
I'll hop on a plane to Dublin and come and give it to you. Thank you very much.